So to clear the confusion, I am not Jason. <laughs> I'm, I'm Aaron. Um, I am the minister to students here at Winchester First Baptist, so all the visitors here. Thank you for coming, and just know that uh, I'm not normally the one standing up here. Um, it's the guy who was baptizing earlier. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, what a great way to start service uh, with a baptism. I mean, a representation of the gospel is something that can fill us with hope, delight, and love every day. So I want to say that, and I want to say good morning to everybody here. So what we're going to start with is we're going to continue where Jason left off in 1 Peter. Um, he ended yet last week with uh, 1 Peter 1, and we're going to pick up right here in chapter 2, and verses 1 through 12. So if you want to go ahead and... Uh, turn to chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, 1 Peter. We'll, we'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> so as I was going through this uh, passage here, um, preparing for this sermon, um, as I was reading it and over and over again, just reading it, trying to figure out where I was going and what I was going to do with this, I was kept reminding myself of when I was in the military, specifically basic training. Um, and some of you sitting in the pews are going to kind of understand what I'm talking about, and the others who haven't done something like that. I'm hoping I can paint a good picture. Um, but I left for the military um, at the ripe age of 19 years old, full of arrogance and wisdom. So I knew everything I was going to do. Um, and I was ready. Uh, I was ready to go through the changes that they were going to say, because I didn't think my character was going to break. I was firm who I was, which we all know that it's not very good when we're firm in that. Um, I was in faith, but not letting God lead me in faith. So when I left, I wasn't scared that I was going to be yelled at or um, broken down or anything like that. I, I knew there was going to be physical activity, and sometimes I just thought, well, this is just going to be a time where I come out, and I'm just in really good shape after this. Well, that night at Fort Benning, Georgia, when I walked off that bus, all of those ideas went out the window. I showed up in ripped jeans, earrings, and ready to think that I could do whatever I wanted, and I was reminded by a nice man in a round hat that I meant nothing. <laughs> Somebody's been there. So I learned, though, throughout that time in basic training um, that there are certain things they want us to live by, and you discipline, your integrity, honor, discipline for watching out for your person to your right and your left, and that's something that as time went by, it just ingrained into me. It turned into who I was, my character. I had been a, become an updated version of who I was before. I had now instilled in myself some things that I didn't think were going to. And these character changes, well, they carried over whenever I left the military and I went into the police force, they carried right over. Those, same, those very same things that I used there in success carried me into success in the police force. And then whenever I came out of it and I started interacting with more people and my family and in my friendships and my social circle, circles, the same thing happened. Those, those uh, ethos and those traits became who I was. And the reason I thought about this when I was reading 1 Peter um, chapter 2 at the beginning here, verses 1 through 12, it's because we're told that we become new. But what's awesome is that when I became new in Christ, I wasn't an updated version of myself or a better version. I was completely new. I was a new creature. My old ways had gone. I did carry some things from those characters into me, but I was instilled with things that I'd never known before. So that's where we're going to start here in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And they say this, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word, so that you may grow up into your salvation if you have tasted the, that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay, Zion, lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe for the unbelieving. The stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, and a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they obey 
disobey the word. They were destined for this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. So starting off in and verses 1 through 3 here, we start with this word, therefore. Now, quickly, with uh, fellowship with other pastors, I've always learned that, I've now learned that the question to ask is, what is the therefore, therefore? Well, this starts with, as a result of, Jason has preached on the first chapter, and he told us that God is our constants, and he's our salvation is secured through him. He told us that early. Then he came back and reminded us that our hope is in Jesus and not the works that we do. And we walk in obedience. It is not when, uh, if we are going to be changed, it's that when we are going to be changed. So that the start of this chapter says, as a result of those things, we should put away these behaviors, these attitudes that are opposite of the fruit of spirit. This malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy. They're opposite of what it tells us in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the spirit, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The law is not against such things. Those list of nine things don't come one at a time. It's called the fruit, not fruits of the Spirit. They come all at once, not in sets of three, all at once. And they come through us through the Holy Spirit. This list becomes who we are when we drop down and fully submit to Jesus being our Lord in our lives. That when we become a new being in Christ, we're not that updated version I talked about or a newer version that I was, thought I was when I was in the military. I'm a whole new thing. We become a whole new creature. And as we embrace what the Holy Spirit's guide us, that hypocrisy, that envy, that malice, those things of the old are replaced by the new, which are those nine things, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And to fortify that and build that on our foundation, we have to stay in the Word. We have to pray to God and lean on one another. That's how we grow together as Christians. So when we struggle, we can look to that fruit and we can gather the fruit from others and say, I need help here. I need building up. Scripture also tells us here that we need pure milk of the the Word, like babies. Now, Peter was not saying that these exiles were new believers, they were saying, just like us as humans, just like us as any living creature, we need to be fed. We need to be fed to be sustained. And like he's saying here, that the Word can sustain us. Christ is the one who can sustain us. So it goes to show us that if we truly repented and we have fallen face first in front of Jesus, it's not a question of when do I stop consuming It becomes a proclamation of, I can't get enough. The scripture here tells us who we are in Christ. And it paints it pretty clearly in verses 1 and 3. But if we're the new creature, and we know that God has a purpose for everything, what is our purpose of living out the gospel as it was given to us? Starting in verse 4, the word of God tells us why we should be this way in Christ. Starting at verse 4, it tells you, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built by a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So he says that Jesus was rejected. The Messiah was rejected by those who knew the law. He was there delivering the truth to a world that was lost, but was still rejected, but later was honored by God as the cornerstone for all of us. So is it surprising that we as believers are constantly under attack? 
If Jesus was rejected, is it surprising that we have the pushback and the opposition that we have from the world today? That each generation we see our numbers sitting in pews fewer and fewer? Well, it's our purpose here. That's why we're called to be living stones of his ministry. But what does that look like? It looks like standing up and carrying our cross daily. That means building our generations in a firm foundation by standing in the word and not being apologetic for it, not compromising for it. Hebrews 13, 15 through 16 tells us, therefore through him let us continually offer up uh, to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of the lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. So it says it's spiritual sacrifices. And then here it tells us sacrifices of sharing and praising God. Those words we don't use together very often. Sacrifice of praise and a sacrifice of, of uh, praising God and sharing. Well, uh, the apostles praise God and shared God and they were burned boiled beaten crucified Jesus himself was rejected for sharing and sacrificing the praise of God in the world we live in today we feel persecuted because our church isn't playing the right music we feel persecuted because the sermon doesn't have a dynamic video playing behind the pastor as he as he speaks church I'm here to tell you that that's just selfishness disguised as persecution that's just us sitting and inserting ourselves into what God has planned for us. It's an issue of convenience because putting off things until later has just become our social norm. That's just what we do. We can do that later. I'll come back to that. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are. None of us sitting in this room have a secure tomorrow in this world. But we can have a secure tomorrow in eternity with God. Jesus Christ is here today and alive now. And the Holy Spirit has tasked us to be priests on this earth. That when we confess and live for Christ, we become his living stone, only changed by the living water himself. We're setting a foundation of the word of God, and we're plainly told that living for Christ, we will not be put to shame, but we will be honored. So if we are hope that our children will grow in church, and walk on their own Christ, we have got to build our foundation. We have got to su uh, submerge them in the love of Christ, surrounded by fellow believers that do not apologize for proclaiming God. Too many times we sit and we see on social media these pastors that say, this isn't me, this is just God. But I'm here to tell you, whenever you say it's God, it's you too. What he speaks, we speak. When he loves, we love. Even if it's difficult, we are to love. We are to show that gentleness. We are to model ourselves after Christ, the one who he sent to save us. Our lives and our testimonies are living examples of God and is designed for us. We can remain in that because if we honor and glorify God, we're told in Scripture that He will honor and glorify us when we finally return home to Him. The world stumbles here in verse 8. It tells us the world stumbles and falls because it's disobedient. It's rejected the good news of Christ. Sometimes worse, it changes the good news. We see many times that We'll hear it and we'll like it and we'll love what they're saying and then they'll say, oh, but Jesus wasn't really God standing in, among men. He was just in right relationship. Or he's not part of the Trinity, he's just a friend of God's. Church, I'm here to tell you that Jesus was God, is God from the beginning to the end, our author and our finisher. So we're told by the world to fear God what they want us to fear, their standard. Own your own home by the time you're 20. I was, not happening. <laughs> not anymore. Uh, have a million dollars in your bank account. If you have that, come find me after service, please. We need to become friends. 
But if those things are what's driving you and your fear of your life, then you're wrong. The only fear we should have is the fear of a life without Christ. I don't have a million dollars in my bank account. I do own a home. I've got four children and we're growing. But I'm happy for what I have because Christ gave it to me and has allowed me to have a family to raise up that I can preach and teach about Jesus. That I can glorify him that even if I'm sitting there, well, we need this, we need this. I'm also reminded through scripture and through my own personal study that I don't need anything. This stuff's not coming with me later. But that guidance I give to my children, when I speak to the youth of this church and to this community, that's what I'm bringing glory to God with, not my possessions. We can't glorify God in anything that we do. There's nothing we can do other than meeting Christ at His will and glorifying the things that He does and gives us. We're not making it on our own. We need Him. So who we are in Christ is different from those around us. We're, we're called to not to worry about things, be different from the world, but we're told here in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12 that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We are God's people. We, had received, we did not have mercy, but then we received it. We're different because we as believers are not a product of this world. When we became that new creature, we put those things away. We put them behind us. We forgot about them. We let the Holy Spirit infect us and change us and convict us so we can become who Christ wants us to be. And sometimes it's not always who we think it should be. I was just talking the other day uh, with Jesse at the coffee shop, and I was telling him, you know, when I was sitting as an SRO at the high school, and I was able to work with some people and meet some people, I thought I was where I was supposed to be. I was like, this is it. I found it. I'm not at the high school anymore. I work here. I work for God because I found out that it's not me that makes those decisions. It's me that follows the will of God. We're the adopted children of God. We are under the authority of God. Growing up in my adult life, I was always told to represent yourself this way. When I was a kid and I went to stay the night with friends, my mom would come and say, it's yes, ma'am. It's no, ma'am. It's yes, sir. It's no, sir. And you eat everything on that plate. I don't care if you hate it. You're a representation of how I've raised you. You're a representation of this family. And as it went into my adult life and I went into work when I was in the military, same way. You represent the U.S. Army. You represent this. When I went to the police force, in uniform, not in uniform. You represent the sheriff's office, the Winchester Police Department, wherever I was working at the time. And I agree with that. We do. We're called to upstand and be fruitful employees to those that we work for, to be following the rules, to do what we're supposed to do, but it should not contradict the authority of God. When we work for those things and we do good things in our work, we should be bringing that glory back to God. They should go, he stands apart for a reason, and that's because he's a follower of Christ. We should never contradict, and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10 tells, verse 10 tells us, we are work, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of us to do. So we receive this mercy because we're sinners. We really don't deserve anything more than death. But this mercy came, and we're marked by our salvation, and it's a statement of that mercy but we're called by the Great Commission to make disciples. All of us. That's not a staff position. That's not a minister's position. Or it's a believer's position. It's that each one of you, as you meet your neighbor, your coworker, your family, your daughter, your son, your aunt, your son-in-law, whatever it is that you are to proclaim the glory of Christ and say, look what he's done for me and what he can do for you. Again, we go back to being unapologetic about it. We don't bend because it makes them feel better. We let them know the truth because the truth is not something to be played with. The truth is what sets us free. It's when we look at the Word, we live in the Word, and we abide by the Word 
that we are truly set free, that those things that we've seen, those hypocrisies and those malice and that envy, that hate, it goes away. It slowly diminishes and it was replaced by those nine things of the fruit of the Spirit. Peter reminds us in verse 11 and 12 here to abstain from those sinful desires that are waging war against our souls. We live in a world now where anything you want is at your fingertips. Fast food can come straight to your door. You don't want to prep your own meals anymore? That's okay. We'll call somebody to come do it for you. You don't want to go out and find somebody? We'll have an app so you can go find somebody and you can live in sexual morality. You want to be by yourself? That's fine. We have an app where you can go and watch whatever you want to watch on your own. We're told to move away from those and rid ourselves of them because if we are in those things, we are not bringing glory and we are not being the light that Christ calls us to be. We do not do this to boast to our friends about how good we have become. I don't do these things so I can stand up and say, guys, model yourselves after me. I must decrease and he must increase. I do this because he has exampled it for me. I can't stand here and say, I'm a pastor because I'm just really good at speaking. I can't stand here and say, I work at this church because I have a really good relationship with kids. No, I'm here because God has given to me some gifts that I'm allowed to use in His glory. There's none who are good. I'm not good at anything. There's only one who is good. Only one. And no matter how we try, we keep springing back whenever we work against the will of God. That's because we continually take ourselves out of the equation. I'm sorry, let me reverse that. We put ourselves into the equation. We put ourselves above God. We need to take ourselves out of the equation. Whenever we look at the Word and we're examining, and the only thing we're doing is, I've got to make sure uh, that I know everything in this Bible so the next time I meet somebody, I can tell them everywhere they're wrong. Mm, that's not right. You need to know what the Bible says so you can store it in your heart and give glory to God even when you're on your own and you don't have it. You need to be prepared in season and out of season. We're called to, be, to love our neighbor as we loved ourselves. That's, our, that's what we have to do. So in Matthew 28, 19, it tells us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not baptizing them in the name of Winchester First Baptist Church. I'm not baptizing him in the name of the Tyner family. I'm baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the instruction we're given as believers in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 12. It goes over that, that we are to be living stones, that we are to daily carry our ministry to the world because we are set apart. And we're set apart because we were lost and now we're found. We were broken, but now he fixed us. Some of us in this room may not know what that means. Some of us in this room might know what it means, but have fallen back from it. Some of you just need a reminder. I know I've found myself there many times, but I find it very simple and told Romans 10, 9, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. It's not a question of how much can you do and how fast can you do it. It's a question of can you let yourself stop putting yourself before Christ and let him lead your life? Can you sit next to your family member who you're having a problem with and tell them, even though you're difficult, I'm still going to love you and I'm still going to share Christ's love with you because that's what he did for me when I deserved it least. That's what we're told to do. And it's difficult sometimes, but we've got to persevere. We've got to go. So this time, this an invitation, I, I invite everyone to come to an altar. And I, I find it crazy that one time I, I used to sit in this very pew and I would wait for this moment to come up here and pray because then I could just let it all go. And I would I'd feel a hand on my back. Some of these men in this room were that hand on my back praying alongside of me. So it's the time of invitation. 
we ask that you come down. We don't ask that you come and talk to us. We ask that you, you come and talk to the Lord. And if you want to know further of how the redeeming blood of Christ can save your life, then we're here to talk to you about that too. I can't sit here and tell you to do it. I can't sit here and pray it for you. It's something that you must do. It's something that you must lay your life down, put your face to the ground, and let Jesus control everything you do the minute you get up. So Marty's going to come up and play for us. And I just ask that you come down, and if you have something that you want to speak to us about, we speak to you. If you have nothing, you sit there and pray. If you want to stay in your seat, I ask that you stay in your seat and pray. Well, there's one thing I do is have an honest conversation with the Lord about who you are in his life and what you're doing for his glory.